up YouTube? Welcome to today's video. One thing that I've done differently today is I've worn a shirt because last time I looked like I wasn't wearing any clothes. So kudos to me for that change. Yay. So today we are going to talk about how Netflix became a $166 billion company. How did that happen? They did that using design thinking. I know it's a kind of a really cool term. What is it? We're going to talk about that. I'm just going to start this off with a story. How many of you have ever been in that position where you're on Netflix and you're browsing and you're trying to find a movie 20 minutes later, you're still looking, you're still searching and you haven't made a decision, right? That's me all the time. And I remember it used to be much worse. Now it's gotten a little bit better. You know, Netflix has Netflix has figured it out. They figured out, okay, people suck at making decisions. How are we going to do that? So we're actually going to look into that today and how Netflix has changed over the last few years so that they've actually helped people make decisions and actually find that movie. So the next time that you Netflix and chill, you actually get to get to the chilling. So let's just go through the backstory of Netflix. Netflix actually started in 1997 as a home delivery service for um, DVD rentals. This is what it used to look like. Look, look at it. This looks nothing like the Netflix we see today. They don't even have the red yet. Then in 2008, that was when they started switching into the DVD rental service where you can get it delivered to your house. And in 2011, they figured out, holy shit, that DVD industry is dead. We need to go online. Nobody is watching videos and VHSs anymore. So you can see that over the years, they have realized that people have different needs and they are going to watch movies in a different way and they had to adapt. Companies like Blockbuster didn't do that. Instead, they went down the same route that everyone else did. They didn't think outside the box and they didn't look at what the real problem was. They said, wait, no one's buying DVDs. Maybe I should run more ads. That's not the way to go. The problem wasn't that people weren't buying DVDs, it's that the whole industry was shifting from DVDs to online, right? And then you have other services out there. Okay, fine, we have online services, but I was torrenting. People are torrenting and they're watching movies illegally. So why would anybody pick Netflix? So what Netflix had to do was they came up with like the best, the best package ever, a safe way to watch movies, with really, really high quality and lots of titles for a very cheap price. And that's how they nailed that industry by really solving the real pain points that their customers had. How they did this was using an approach called design thinking. And, and design thinking is based around a, something called the design process. I know this sounds a lot of designs, design, 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 but it's not really something that's only for designers is a way of thinking. It's a way of generating new ideas and new solutions that are actually useful to the end user who is your customer. And they do that by having a really deep human approach when it comes to analyzing a problem. And this is the word, which is a very technical word, um, which might be new to some of you, which is human centered design. Human centered design focuses on another person and it focuses on the needs and desires and requirements of your customer. So me as a customer, as an end user for Netflix, what would, what would be a service that I need? What are the things that I desire? How will Netflix fit into my everyday life? How do I plan to watch Netflix? Those are the questions that they need to start asking themselves before they start designing a problem. So the design process is broken down into five different steps. And these steps are different depending on who's teaching it. Um, the uh, Stanford's model from D school, they have five steps. It's empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And depending on which resource you go to, whether it's ideal or something, the design process might be seven steps or it might be three steps. At the end of the day, it's all the same thing. They're just using different words to define the same process. What is the most important though is the basis of the design process, which is it revolves around human-centered design and also the concept of 
iterating and prototyping and constantly evolving. So the design cycle actually never ends. It keeps going. There's always something new that you're learning and there's always something else that you can improve on. So what I'm going to do today right now is we're going to jump into a case study for Netflix. I'm going to walk you through how Netflix has changed over the last 20 years and how they use the design thinking uh, the design process to improve their product. And we're going to walk through the design phase for each of those looking at their product. So um, the discovery phase in the discovery phase, like I mentioned before, right? Me and my boyfriend had this problem. We could not figure out the best way to, to watch videos um, and just make a decision on Netflix. So I'm going to use Netflix as a case study to walk you through the design process. We'll go through their product and see how we can use the design process to really see how Netflix has changed their product. So let's say we are in the discovery phase. The discovery phase is the first phase of the design process. And in this phase, this is where you are understanding the actual pain points of your customer. This is where you're doing your research, you're looking at the market and you're looking at potential customers and you're asking these really deep dive questions. So you're trying to understand where are you using the product? Why are you using the product? What is the motion? What is the motivation behind it? So let's say, for example, me and my boyfriend, we are using Netflix as a way to relax and spend time together, right? So we're using it at night. We might be using it on the train and then when you ask these types of questions it helps you understand what the real problem is behind why someone might not be able to make a decision for picking a movie in the discovery phase it's really really crucial you spend a lot of time here so you're not solving the wrong problem later on i see a lot of companies that say oh pro this problem x is what is actually wrong but when they look into it, problem X is caused by problems A, B, C. So if you don't target and fix problems A, B, C, you're still going to have problem X, right? So it's really to get you to think outside of what is the problem that you perceive. And then in the second stage, that is in the interpretation stage. That is when you're clarifying what the real problem is. You're looking at the data that you've collected and all the pain points that people are saying, and you're trying to read between the lines and say, what are the actually trying to tell me when they say, okay, I'm having trouble picking a movie. Why are people having trouble picking a movie? Is it because there are too many options? Is it because there aren't enough previews? There's not inf enough information about the movie so they can't decide. And I think that that is really what it is, right? Like if you look into decision making, the more options you have, the harder it is for you to make a decision. And that is kind of what's happened to Netflix. They have thousands of titles and you don't want to pick the wrong movie. You might see a new title you've never seen before and you're curious about watching it. You might go in five minutes in and you realize you hate it. And because you have that experience in the back of your mind, now you're like, shit, the next time I watch a movie, I better pick the right one. So because there's too many options and none of them stood out from one another, how do we improve that? A really good example, if we look at one of Netflix's old UIs, I'm gonna put that up right here. You can see here that there's no visual hierarchy. All we have are the covers of the movies. There's no description, there's no trailer. So back then it was really hard to make a decision on which movie to watch. So they actually use the design process to say, okay, there's not enough information for people to make a decision here. We need to improve this. At this stage as well, on step two, this is also where you're going to define your problem statement. So in whichever year this was created, I'm gonna say, 2016 or 2011, their problem statement would have been, how do we improve our interface so that people are provided more information so that they can pick the correct movie? And then that brings us to step three of the design process, which is ideation. This is where you get crazy. You come up with all these cool ideas to try and solve your problem statement, and you are gonna go as outside of the box as possible. You know, you can't keep thinking in the same way because you're never gonna come up with a new solution. Depending on how big your company is, you might actually blend these next three steps together. So step four is actually the prototype phase. And then step five is the testing phase. In a smaller company, you would create a, a low fidelity prototype, which is a very, very scrappy version of your idea. You might even just write it out on a piece of paper and then that would be your prototype. And then you would go and show it to other people and ask for feedback and ask, hey, was this what you were looking for? Does this solve your pain point? And then based on what they say, you go and make changes to your prototype. 
And then once it's really well done, you go to step five, which is testing, which is when you actually go build it out and you present it to the public. Another way to look at it is by combining steps three, four and five as one, which is called evolution. And, and this is why the design process is so interesting is because it never ends. In the design world, you are constantly improving your product. And take, for example, Netflix. They created this amazing product. They could have left it where it was in 2011, but they kept testing. They got data from their users and they did surveys to figure out how can we improve this experience? How can we help people choose the right title? How do we surface the right titles to the right people? Everybody has different preferences and they A-B tested different versions of their interface to make sure it was the best one. So one of the things they did a few years ago was, okay, we are gonna surface our best content at the top. It's just gonna be a picture. And then we're gonna show pictures of all the different DVDs and movies and TV series we have available. The problem here was, Every person has different interests. I might like horror movies. My friends might like romance movies. So it didn't make sense for everyone's interface to look the same. And that's when they started testing to what we see today by surfacing your, your my picks list to the top and then your recommendations to the top and then recently added. So then they have this hierarchy for what information might be the most relevant for you. And then back then, Netflix didn't have any of those, the hover effects where when you hover over a video, it would do a, a, a instant play of a trailer. That never existed. Back then, you had to go look at the title of the movie, go to YouTube, watch the trailer, or go to Rotten Tomatoes and IMDB and look for the review and then come back. Right, so Netflix has simplified that process for you over the years. They realized the problem that we have was there wasn't enough information about which title was relevant to their user. So they built all of that in. Each of the videos, each of the shows have a rating system. So you can see how relevant it is to you based on your previous browsing history. They also have likes and dislikes so they can offer better recommendations for you they also have all the categories and the categories are rearranged based on your history as well. So much customization, so much has changed in the last few years, making it the best viewing experience for the user. And then you start thinking even bigger picture, right? People like to watch Netflix on the go or on their iPads or at home. So if you log onto the same account, they remember the last place that you stopped watching. And then if you were watching it on your iPad and then you came home and you wanted to watch it on your computer, you can log back in and it starts the video at the same spot. It's so intuitive, right? They've just improved their product so much over the years. And they did this by using this design process where they look at what users need, they do some testing, and they create a prototype. I can show you even crazier stuff. Here we can see that they've actually changed their description panel for each video and each film. It used to be on the right-hand side, but then they did a heat map where people's eyes would fall first on a screen, and they noticed they were always reading on the left side. And that's why now you can see that all the titles and all the previews are on the left side of your screen, and the text is on the right side of the screen. And it's just because they've done so much testing. I just really, really wanted to share that use case with you because I thought Netflix is the perfect example of how they've used design thinking to really, really grow. So they escaped the fate that Blockbuster had because they did not decide to stay in that realm of a DVD store because they knew it was a changing and a dying industry and they took it online. And then they took it so far that now my parents at home, we don't even have cable. I don't have cable. The only subscription service I have is Netflix. And it's incredible. So I really just wanted to share that with you because I thought that this use case was so incredibly cool. And I didn't realize how much they had changed until I started looking into it. And it's incredible. It's extremely 
inspirational to know that how much their product has changed and how much they've grown because they put in that time and effort to really think about the end user who is someone like you and someone like me. How are my customers interacting with my product? Where are they using it? In what environment? You know, some people are watching it with their family. Some people are using it for Netflix and chill. And you need to accommodate all these different types of personalities. So next week, I'll be showing my video on the actual, where I did a, I'm at Mind Valley. I actually hosted a design thinking event and it's a workshop where I taught people design thinking. And we actually run through a separate project there of how to apply design thinking in a smaller scale. Um, something called the wallet project. So you should check out next week's video to see how that played out. And everyone really loved it. And it's a really hands-on way to put in place what I, what I shared today. This was a very, very high level explanation. I just wanted to show you the potential that is there and that design thinking is possible in every industry. It's not limited to designers. It's not limited to engineers. It is just a way of creative problem solving to come up with new ideas. That was really all I had wanted to share in today's video. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, there's so much that I want to talk about when it comes to design and I just don't know where to start. So I thought starting with a use case of how powerful design thinking is and how much it can change a product, I thought that would be a really nice way to introduce the topic. If there's anything that I had left out or if there's something that you want me to focus on, please let me know in the comments. Please like, comment and subscribe. And if there's something that I forgot, maybe you can teach me instead. I'm still fine tuning the direction that I want to take this channel in. And I'd really love if you guys can tell me um, what, what you want out of it. For me, I really just want to spread the message of design and how powerful it is. I, I really want to clean up. Everyone has this misconception that they can't be a designer or they don't know how to think like a designer, but that's not true at all. It's just little practices, right? Like you didn't learn a language uh, in one day. It's something you just learned over time because you practiced it. And design thinking is very, very much like that. So with that, I will leave you guys with one note. Try your best to implement some design thinking into your life. There are so many benefits when it comes to it in any situation. Maybe it's problem solving with your spouse. Maybe it's problem solving for your business. But please take a look at some of the resources that I'm going to include below if you're interested to learn more in design thinking. Until next time, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's video.